show of fortitude and of promise this past week for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. Hello everyone, Ken Henderson filling in for Bruce Beck. Welcome to another edition of the Kevin Bannon Show. And this past Saturday, the Scarlet Knights found themselves in a tough position. Down 10 points at the half to the Boston College Eagles, but then Jeff Greer stepped it up 21 points in the second half to earn the Scarlet Knights their 17th win of the season. And then Tuesday night at UConn, the number two team in the country was given more than it could handle almost by the Scarlet Knights. A tough game, but UConn finally pulled away and the Scarlet Knights lose by 13. As we bring in the coach of the Scarlet Knights, coach, I guess as we go along in the season, you learn something each and every week about your team. What did you learn this week? Well, it sure was an interesting week for us. You know, we learned a lot about ourselves. I think we're a tough bunch of kids. We're hungry. We deserve to be in the postseason. We've got to go out and get it done. We were really tested with BC and certainly with UConn. We, we did some good things. We did some bad things. But I do think we're getting better as a group and ready for this last week of the season. Okay, plenty of highlights to catch you up on. Let's go back to Saturday at the rack for the Boston College game. The 1978 Final 16 team was being honored. Coach James Bailey and others on hand. And early on, Jeff Billett off the turnover. 16 turnovers on the night for Boston College to rob. That was a great night. You know, good to have the great players back in the house. It was a tremendous crowd, which really helped us in a game where we struggled. Uh, here you see some good transition off our defense, but not enough of that in the first half, and that's why we found ourselves down. Boston College goes on a 14-2 run over a 6-27 span. Brian Ross with a three-pointer here, seven points all in the first half, and then Kenny Walls, who had a big first half, 12 for him. Well, you know, when they come into your building, you don't want another team to have a lot of confidence, but as you see, these are open shots. Our defense were a little bit slow to, to reacting to things, and they made some shots, and, you know, a young, fearless team got some confidence, and that's not good. Well, you were down by 10 at the half. Did you have to say anything to your team? I had to say a lot of things to my team, but basically they, they knew what they had to do. We had to step up the defense and get some transition going, and that's exactly what we did. Well, the second half was the Jeff Greer Show. 21 points on 7 for 8 shooting, 3 for 3 from 3-point range. Uh, Jeff was great. Here you just see the kid's versatility. We're going to finish with a little bit of contact, steps out, hits threes, makes his foul shots. He's, you know, the kid has so much talent, and he's just starting to realize how good a player that he can really be. Averaging 11 points per game this season, over 14 points in the last four, and even when he couldn't make it, guys like Dante Jones was there to put it up and in. It was definitely a total team effort in that second half. Everybody stepped up a little bit. Uh, would have been a, a real tough loss for us. But everybody stepped up, particularly at the defensive end, and uh, we were able to get a win when we weren't playing at our highest level. Rashad Kent, great game, 16 points, four boards, six for six from the field. Yeah, we felt Rashad's matchup was one that we had to win. We had a little bit of an advantage with interior strength, and Rashad did a great job. Defense creates offense. Rob Hodgson with the block, four blocks for Rutgers on the night, and Greer finishes. Yeah, that's, that's what we had to get. You didn't see enough of that in the first half, but boy, in the second half, we probably played our best half of basketball. It was good to see. Earl Johnson, four assists on the night. Here to Joel Salvi for the dunk. Put you up by 10. And then the big fella, well, surprises you with this one, maybe quickness to the ball, basket, and one. Well, what's impressive is not only the quickness, but the finish. You know, he was able to get a little bit of contact and get the ball up to the rim. And, you know, it's just a little piece of what you're going to see from Rashad in the future. Tuesday night in stores, Richard Hamilton gets UConn off quick. They were up to a 14 to 5 lead. Yeah, that's not what you want to happen. You know, you go into the number two team in the country. Gym. Uh, you want to get some stops early, you want to get some confidence early, and that was the biggest thing that didn't happen. You know, we were like on our heels immediately and trying to claw back in the entire night, and that's not the position you want to be in. It was certainly a game of spurts, but Jeff Billett exercised some demons. Coming into this game, he was shooting about 10% from the field for his career against UConn. He had a great first half and a great game. Yeah, Jeff played a solid floor game for us against their tenacious defense. He took care of the ball, he made big shots, and you know, they, they, they really, uh, you know, we have more weapons now, so we did a great job, I think, of getting Jeff the ball and putting him in a position to score. Second half, Jeff Greer with the dunk and then down low to Kent. And after the free throw, it's a nine-point game. As I said, it's a game of spurts. It seemed like every time you guys cut it to five or six, they would answer. Exactly, and that's why they're a great basketball team. I mean, we, I thought our kids were very resilient after a bad start. We did some real nice things in the second half, but every time we got it down to five or six, uh, they'd make a big play, and that's why they're in the position that they're in. Rebounding a big story, 37-22 to 22, UConn, 16 offensive boards, and that led to 16 second-half 
second chance points. But as I said, you guys did not go away. No, not at all. I mean, the kids did a good job. Our defense stepped up. But as you mentioned, the rebounding, I think a lot of it was fresh legs. They just go a little bit deeper than we go. Uh, and they ran them in and out, and they were able to get it done. Off the fast break, you'll see Rob give it up to Jeff, and he will return the favor. And with about six minutes to go, it was a six-point game. Yeah, like I said, there were some real good things that we did, basically off our defense. When our defense is good, we score, you know. But uh, a lot of weapons on their team, and they, they were tenacious here. Too many second-chance opportunities. Here's another one coming up here. Freeman's a terrific player. We really had, a, had a problems to keeping him under control. Well, some solid efforts for the Scarlet Knights. Jeff Greer with 21 points, 9 rebounds, 64% from the field against Boston College. Well, he's a key guy for us. We need him down the stretch. He's so versatile, and, and he can score in so many different ways that uh, this is a big time of year for Jeff to step up. The big fellow, Rashad Kent versus Boston College, 16 points, perfect from the field. We, we love the way Rashad's playing right now. I think he's fresh. Uh, he's got li lively legs, and we're making it more of his foul shots, so I think this kid's going to finish the season in great shape. Jeff Billett, a big game versus UConn and big for his confidence. Well, he's certainly been consistent for us, uh, playing the point, doing all the right things, and he's a hungry guy, wants to finish in, on, a, on a high note. And Rob with a solid last two games, averaging just over eight points and over six rebounds per game. Well, we need Rob to step up. This is a time of year for our seniors. Jeff's certainly done it, and we need a little bit more from Rob. Well, Coach, after 25 games, 17-8, and eight, looking pretty good for a postseason bid. I feel good about where we are right now. It's such an important time for us to bear down, get some wins going into the Big East tournament. We could feel like we already are a postseason team. Well, now it's time for our weekly segment entitled Why at Work. It's where the coach breaks down a play. It's brought to you by the Rutgers Court Club. And, Coach, take us through this play at Boston, uh, Houston, B.C. Well, this is transition where we try to get out and run and see if we can't get an easy basket off two-on-one, three-on-two. But what happens is, and it often happens, we don't get one, but the kids stay with it, and we end up getting one on the inside for Rashad. And uh, everybody did a nice job here of executing our, our secondary break. It really all starts with Jeff. I mean, Jeff has to take the middle of the court, and everybody has to run their lanes well. And we did that, which puts their defense in a position where they've got to communicate. And we hope that they, you know, will we'll mess up a mismatch or something will happen. But actually, BC does a good job here, but our kids stay with it. We get a ball reversal, and Rashad gets numbers down low, puts his body on somebody. See, he's open now, but he's even more open when we reverse the ball, and he, he goes in and posts up, and uh, Dante Jones does a wonderful job of getting him a, b a bounce pass and gives him a chance to score. Great position down low by the big fellow. Well, that was it right there. If Rashad's not ready, we're not going to get him, and he was ready. He planted himself. He's impossible to get around when he plays low to the floor like that, and Dante leads him very, very well with a bounce pass, and Rashad does what he does best, gets it up to the rim and finishes. And once again, that is why it worked. It's brought to you by the Rutgers Court Club each and every week right here on the Kevin Bannon Show. Well, when we return to the Kevin Bannon Show, we take a look up next at the team who the Scarlet Knights call their in-state foes, the Seton Hall Pirates, when we return. <laughs> Welcome back to the Kevin Bannon Show. Up next for the Scarlet Knights, their in-state rivals, the Seton Hall Pirates. This Sunday at the Continental Airlines Arena, game time is 12 o'clock, where the Seton Hall Pirates are led by Tommy Amaker. In his second season, the game can be seen on CN8. And, Coach, a great year by Tommy, who entered the Big East the same year as you. Yeah, they've done a nice job. I think that they're knocking on postseason door, and, you know, it's always a heated rivalry, but it's a friendly rivalry, and I think it's great for the fans, and, and we have great respect for them. It's going, to be, uh, it's going to be a big challenge for us. Their junior guard, Shaheen Holloway, is questionable because he has a sprained neck and shoulder that he injured in the Notre Dame game, but when he's playing 11 points and almost six assists per game. Well, I don't think he's questionable. He'll be out on that court and because uh, he's a competitor, and uh, he makes everyone around him better and controls that tempo and just really like their team. I think there's a lot of similarities between our teams, uh, very strong in the perimeter. We're both not the most physical teams, but we make up for it in a lot of ways. So it's going to be a tough match, particularly on their court. Called Canis on the outside, averaging 13.4 points per game, coming off 18 against UConn, and Gary Saunders, the transfer from Georgia Tech. Yeah, he's tough. You know, he's a guy that, as you see, he can, he can go down and post somebody up, but then he can step out and hit a deep three, and 
You know, the matchups are interesting, and it's, it's, it's going to be quite a challenge. Inside, they have Dwayne Jordan, the senior forward, nine and a half points per game, and Chucky Moore from the outside at eight points per game, and Ty Shine has also provided a spark when Holloway has not been there. Yeah, I think that's really a key with Seton Hall, the emergence of Chucky Moore and of Ty Shine, the way they've really come on of late, and that's why I think that they're very much a legitimate postseason team because they're getting good bench play, much like we are late in the season. Okay, after Seton Hall, the Scarlet Knights are at home for the Georgetown Hoyas, and they will be led by Greg Escherich. He was the longtime assistant, 17 years behind John Thompson, taking over on January the 8th. Uh, he's done a great job. You know, this team's another team that's gotten better as the year's gone on. They're knocking on the postseason door. Uh, they're going to want to get us back. We played very well down there and stole a win down there. So, you know, we've got two tough ones coming up. Kevin Braswell had 16 points and 6 assists the first time around. And the sophomore guard, Anthony Perry, also came up with 16 points. He's out of St. Anthony High School in Jersey City. They're an exciting, you know, young team. This backcourt's electric. They can put up some big numbers, and uh, we're really going to have to play great defense to get a win at home. Jamil Watkins with 12 points and 8 boards the first meeting. He's averaging over 9 points a game. And then... They have a guy inside with probably the best name in the Big East Conference with Ruben Boomshay Boomshay. Uh, I think that the key to this team is, is if they can take care of the basketball and then the big fellows get involved, they're, they're as big as any team in the league. So you've got to keep them off the offensive glass. If, if they're killing you the way we just showed there, that's, that's going to be a long night for Rutgers. Trey Kilpatrick had six points and two boards. Nat Burton, 11 points per game, but he didn't have a good game the first time around. No, he didn't, but he's playing extremely good basketball. He's probably their best player right now, uh, putting up good numbers and playing real well down the stretch. So I think it's a different Georgetown team than we're going to see, and them coming in the rack, it's a, it's a huge game for us, and we've got to be ready for that team. Most of the Scarlet Knight fans, however, looking towards Sunday. The in-state rivals coach, what are your keys against the Seton Hall Pirates? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is execute our half-court offense. I have great respect for the defense that Seton Hall plays, and we can't let them take us out of things and just take care of the basketball and execute. I, I think the, uh, the next thing we have to do is win the battle in the paint because neither team is the biggest, most physical team, so whoever can get more production down low I think is going to have a big edge. And then lastly, I just think we have to play the kind of solid team defense. They're like us, a lot of weapons, a lot of guys on a given night that can get 15 to 20 points but not just one player. So we have to play very solid defense to have a chance to win this game on the road. Well, earlier this week, we had a chance to talk to some of the Scarlet Knights about their upcoming game against the Seton Hall Pirates. You know, I think it just, uh, I think the attention that that, that brought, uh, both, you know, both coaches coming in, Coach Avocar, Coach Banner coming in at the same time, uh, coming into, uh, you know, programs that they're trying to build up, uh, you know, and, and we've had some good games already, so it's just, uh, it just, it just adds, and it's a, it really has. It's, it's becoming really big. I tell you, I wasn't really aware of it when I first came here, you know, for maybe the first year or so, but then, you know, the Seton Hall thing just kind of seemed to pop up, and, uh, you know, it's, it's big. It's in-state. It's close. Uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons you want to win that game. We have a lot on the line, but we just have to just keep stay focused and play hard. Seton Hall's going to come at us no matter what, even though they, they, they probably don't have the chances that we have right now, just, but we just have to play hard all around. Seton Hall. And us are now both fighting for, for postseason, you know, berths. And so there's more at stake now in this game than, you know, maybe three years ago when we were both below 500. But now now not only is, you know, Big East, um, you know, placing involved, but also, you know, postseason. So the importance grows. When we come back on the Kevin Bannon Show, the big man on campus joins us, Rutgers Center, Rashad Kent. <laughs> Welcome back to the Kevin Bannon Show. Now joining us is the Rutgers freshman center, Rashad Kent, who's already played 25 games this season. Does it still feel like you're a freshman? Um, well, certainly. Um, I have to think of it that way. It's just that um, I don't think I'm playing like, you know, the normal freshman does. So I'm just going to have to stay focused and um, try to give my team 100% every time I step on the floor, and hopefully we'll come away with a, a lot more wins. What has been your biggest adjustment from the high school game to the college game? Well, um, you know, now I'm really expected to give 100% every time I lace them up, whether it's in practice or a game. You know, um, the long hours usually, you know, in high school you practice 
maybe an hour and a half, and then you go home, and then that's it. But that's not the case here. You practice for maybe two, two and a half hours, three hours. Then you go to study hall, and then, you know, it depends on how practice went. You might have to come back early the next morning and different things like that. So um, my days are always consumed with uh, either school, basketball. I have a little time to sleep, and then it's back to school and back to basketball. Coach, has he surprised you this year with his play? Well, in some ways he has because I think he's, uh, he's surpassed the on-the-court stuff. I knew he was going to be a great player for us, but I think uh, his feel for the game and, and his adjustment, because he's so bright, and he's kind of fearless. He's a very physical guy. I think he's turned the corner, and he, he's being modest, saying he's playing like a freshman. He's playing like an upperclassman for us right now. And it's a story when he misses. He's shooting about 69% from the field. He does a great job with his positioning, and Rashad, like a lot of players, don't do. Rashad understands you know, what he can and can't do, and he does a wonderful job of putting himself in a position to do what he does well, and that's finish around the basket. As his career comes on, he will move out. I mean, he's a good ball handler right now. We need a little work on his outside shot, but he will play as a four-man, much like a Kevin Freeman for UConn. That's what this guy's going to be like down the road. But right now, he's doing what we need him to do, and he's doing it quite well. Rashad, what are some of the reasons that you decided to come to Rutgers? Um, well, I wanted to be a part of a program that, um, was, that really needed a resurgence. And I felt that, you know, coming here, the, this program would be doing that. And um, Coach Bannon, he's a great coach, and he, he was bringing in a great staff. And, um, you know, I felt that, you know, it, had, it was a great academic school to be in just in case basketball never worked later on down the road. And um, I really, on my visit, the people treated me well, and I liked what I saw. Well, when you look at Rashad's numbers, they are certainly outstanding. The field goal percentage is the number that sticks out, but nine and a half points per game, four-point rebounds per game. And, Coach, he certainly is not playing like a freshman. Not at all. I mean, and he's scratching the surface right now what this kid can really bring to the table. He's learning how to play with fouls. I mean, this is a, a work in progress. There's so much talent there, and he's going to get there because, as I said before, he's very bright, and he's a relentless worker. So when, when they have those qualities to go along with this guy's talent, I mean, the sky's the limit for Rashad Kent. And, you know, a lot of people make the point about your offensive prowess, but you're a pretty good defender as well. Yeah, you know, I try. I mean, most of my matchups, I'm either like uh, five or six inches shorter than um, my opponent. And, you know, I try to use my strength and quickness to get around him when he thinks I'm sleeping to um, come up with a steal. And usually that's the case. Well, speaking of steals, Coach, that happens to be the topic of our Hoop of the Week. And this was tough to pick this week, but with the big fella on set, you know, I wasn't going to tell him he wasn't part of it. It's the Hoop of the Week brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts, and we go back to the BC game. Coach, showing some quickness there and then finishing. Well, what I said before about Rashad, I think he... It's really fun to watch people say, boy, I didn't know Rashad could do this, or I didn't know he could do that. We see it every day in practice, right there, the quickness, the anticipation. He, he, he puts the ball on the floor a little bit, and then look at the finish. You know, the guy tries to intentionally foul him, and he still finds a way to finish it. So there you see a little bit of what people are going to see down the road for Rashad, and it's pretty exciting. Well, that, of course, is the Dunkin' Donuts Hoop of the Week. Rashad, best of luck to you and the Scarlet Knights the rest of the way. Thank you. All right, when we come back, we take a look around the Big East right here on The Kevin Bannon Show. Welcome back on The Kevin Bannon Show. Now it's time, as we do each and every week, to go around the Big East. Around the Big East is brought to you by New Jersey Transit. Here's a look back at what happened this week in the Big East Conference. Saturday, the second-ranked Huskies survived a scare from the Seton Hall Pirates. Hot shooting from Remus Caucanus helped the Pirates grab a two-point halftime lead. And although the Huskies shot only 33% from the field, key baskets late gave them the 53-48 to 48 win. The Miami Hurricanes improved to 7-1 on the road in conference play with a 69-65 win at Providence. Johnny Hemsley's 24 helped Miami earn their 11th conference win. Saturday night, Tyrone Grant returned for the Red Storm as they defeated Villanova by seven. Grant had 14 points and 17 rebounds and helped key a 19-6 run in the second half that improved the Johnnies to 20-6 and 11-3 and in the conference. 
Sunday, Ryan Blackwell scored 19 points and grabbed eight boards as Syracuse won their 17th of the season. But it was Alan Griffin's block that turned the tide for Syracuse and then Jason Hart's three-pointer that put the game on ice. Freshman Troy Murphy scored 32 points, but it wasn't enough to knock off the Mountaineers. Marcus Gouri had 27, Elton Scott 21, as West Virginia held off the Irish 85 to 80. Five players scored in double figures for St. John's, and the Friars' sloppy play helped the Red Storm crush Providence by 34. In two games this season versus Providence, St. John's has won by a total of 61 points. Tuesday was a record night for the Hurricanes. Miami set a school record by earning their 12th conference win as they crushed Villanova 103-82. In the meantime, Tim James became just the seventh player in Big East history to accumulate 1,000 points and 500 rebounds in league play. Well, Coach, as we take a look at the Big East standings, a lot of action up top with UConn, Miami, St. John's, and then the Scarlet Knights in fourth. Well, we got a heck of a battle here for fourth place, and we have to try to hold on here down the stretch. Miami playing well, and in the second half, Seton Hall, Notre Dame, Georgetown, West Virginia, Pittsburgh, and BC. Yeah, there's a, you know, as you see how close everyone is together, a lot's going to happen in the last week as it normally does. So it's going to be very interesting next eight to ten days to see how this whole thing plays out for the Big East tournament. And when you take a look at the RPI rankings as far as the conference goes, five teams in the top 40. That's, that's important. I mean, we're a strong league. It's been a great year for the Big East, and we hope to get six teams in, and I think our RPI shows that we deserve six teams in the tournament. There's the Scarlet Knights, 24, Villanova at 35, Syracuse at 42, and then Providence, well, they've dropped a little in the last few weeks. Well, the schedule's been tough for Providence, and it's, uh, it's going to be interesting, like I said over the week, see what happens with everybody. If everybody wins out, wins the games they're supposed to win, uh, I think we, we should get six teams in the tournament. All right, when we come back on the Kevin Bannon Show, we'll wrap it up. President about the Scarlet Knights NCAA tournament chances, and when you take a look at their resume, pretty impressive, Coach. Well, I think there's a lot of things there that, that say that we're a postseason team, and we've earned that right. But I think what we're kind of focusing on is, look, we have three games in seven days, two of them on the road, all tough opponents. Go out and win a couple games and then take the mystery away from it all and be, a po be an NCAA team going into the Big East tournament. All right, Coach, best of luck to you. We'll see you next time on the Kevin Bannon Show. Absolutely the most popular person in our party. We love him. For no love, on page one of the right-wing local paper in Manchester, New Hampshire, Bill Clinton continues to divide America. I think that it's unseemly for Democrats to greet him with, with a great deal of... Got it coming up in the forecast. And Jerry, how about sports? What do you have? Well, the Giants uh, make a big quarterback move, and Seton Hall and Rutgers renew their rivalry this weekend. Sports is next. As the number one quarterback, on to college basketball, it has the makings of North Carolina Duke. The rivalry, that is, when Seton Hall and Rutgers meet on Sunday at the Meadowlands. And the capacity crowd is expected uh, <clears throat> for one of the state's biggest rivalries. Seton Hall coach Tommy Amaker and Rutgers coach Kevin Bannon talked about the matchup this week at the Meadowlands. It's the biggest meeting so far between the two who have guided both programs to quick success in just two short seasons. Everything is here to make this uh, a spectacular rivalry. Two teams that are close in proximity to each other you know, within obviously the same state in the same conference, recruiting the same players, uh, two new coaches coming on the scene at the same time, uh, hopefully two programs trying to rebuild storied past and tradition. So uh, there are a lot of things here that make this, I think, uh, into a very nice rivalry. And the fact that when we both got into the Big East, I think really Really solidified that this was going to be special and then certainly with Tommy and I coming on board in the same year 
you know, that we've, it's kind of unique, and uh, I think that it's it's been real fun for the fans, and uh, we, we both have just scratched the surface, I think, of what the programs are going to become. Last season, the two split their home-and-home home series, but all records aside, when they meet on Sunday, a win would be huge for both programs. Rutgers is still trying to lock down an NCAA bid, while Seton Hall is hoping to make the NIT. When you play in the Big East and you're you know, playing for postseason, you've you got a lot of these mountains that you have to climb, but certainly when, when it is Rutgers and Seton Hall, I think it is special. I mean, it's more special for the fans and, and your administrators and all that kind of stuff, but hey, let's face it, the fact that this game is in late February even makes it more special when we're both trying to get to the postseason, so there won't be any shortness of intensity or uh, fun or interest uh, statewide. And uh, as they say, uh, you can throw out the records when these two meet, especially Absolutely. with so much on the line. <laughs> Place will be jump it That's and back right. to the Raptors. <laughs> All right, Jerry, thank you. Well, we have headed into the break on a 9 4 run. The guys from Philly running in the third, Jermaine Robinson. Pretty move. He had 14, 36, 32 grats. But the next time down, Billet would answer. Top of the key, three ball. He had three in the game, 36, 35. Grats would take a 38, 35 lead after three. Sherrod Carroll, the alley oop. But with 17, seven, 17 seconds left in regulation, CBA is down 43, 38 till Pat Lynch drills the tough three, 43, 41. Four seconds left. Lynch would work to Mike Scrocky, he hits a three to tie it and send it into overtime. And in the OT, it was the Rutgers bound Todd Billett coming up with the game winner off the baseline, 23 for Todd. We were running for a, a double screen over to the wing, and um, I, I took a dribble towards the baseline, and I saw the big man rotate. So I said, I'm going to have to get this one off quick, because he's about 6'8 down there. So I, I took a quick pull up, tried to get it over him, a little loft on it, and, and, and it went right in. So, that, And then we had to play D, and that wasn't six seconds left, the game fought over. Uh, and we came into the timeout, and then we got the defense together, and we stopped. So what's Bobby Hurley Jr. doing as he waits for a call? And this man about that high school. His ability to get other people involved. And uh, great body, terrific three-point shooter, and uh, probably one of the top two juniors in the state of New Jersey. If he's not the top, the other one would be Marcus Toniel at Seton Hall Prep. And I hey you. You've got all about the men's and women's basketball programs, all at the state of New Jersey that is coming up this weekend. Next game on the schedule for the Seton Hall Pirates. Kind of odd that it has come up this late in the season, also with postseason implications for both teams, both trying to play beyond the Big East tournament at Madison Square Garden. Well, we thought we would take a look ahead at the big Seton Hall-Rutgers matchup through the eyes of several people who know a little bit about the game. Well, I, I think it's just great for both both fans. I mean, uh, you know, you get anticipation before big games, but you don't get anticipation like this in the state. Uh, you know, I, I've heard a lot of fans ask me about the game. Who do I like? What do I think? You know, am I going to the game? You know, you know, things of that nature, which you normally don't do, even when the Syracuse is in town or Georgetown or Connecticut. Um, it just seems like it has sort of gotten to the people in the state, and they're interested, in, and, and both teams are very interested. Well, I think uh, one of the reasons we wanted to put a bigger spotlight on it was uh, to make this a big event in the state of New Jersey and uh, you know now with both Rutgers and Seton Hall in the same league uh, we're gonna play every year we may play twice a year and everything but this one should be special because it's it's you know the two preeminent schools basketball schools in the state and we have some other great schools obviously but um, but to put a focus on it to get people in the state thinking about um, uh, Rutgers basketball Seton Hall basketball this particular game and um, you know just feel a sense of pride in the state. This is a natural and we want to make it into a, a big event every year. What do I believe? You have to understand something. Can you name a state in the union where two schools that have, that have been to the Final Four have played each other only 34 times although they started playing each other in 1915? This is incredible. That's why this game is so important. This state needs this game from a, from a, from a dignity standpoint, from a pride standpoint. Well, uh, I'm getting a lot of fans coming up to me telling me they got a little side bets with their friends from Rutgers. Uh, got uh, people and family who go to Rutgers that's having a little bets. They're like, go out there and get a win. They got a little, and uh, that's good for the program. It's good for the fans to go out there and have a, a bigger crowd and more, more at stake here, you know, for both, everybody. I have numerous students and fans coming up to me requesting tickets, mainly because they have financial bets on them and, you know, they have friends that 
at Rutgers and they're talking trash back and forth. So it's basically, you know, all talking about their bets. Uh, I think I think it's going to be a very good competitive game. Um, surprisingly, unlike last year, I think that was a little bit. Um, I, I didn't expect what happened last year when when Seton Hall went down to Rutgers. It just I don't think was prepared for that uh, intensity, the energy in the in the Rutgers Athletic Center and that kind of thing. And I don't think Rutgers, uh, you know, conversely was was quite ready again for Seton Hall when they came to the Meadowlands. You know, so I think that uh, both teams having players that have been through this once, understanding what the game means, what it means in the state, what it means to their fans. I think you're going to see a high energy game, and particularly since they're only playing once this year. Okay, we're in a situation now where this game has an added importance because of who these two teams are. Is that added importance apparent to you and to your team while you're getting ready, or is this basically just getting ready for another opponent? That stuff kind of goes on on television and the newspapers and uh, all around you. Well, it's hard for the players not to feel the energy, the excitement about this game when, as our players mentioned when they were interviewed about, everywhere they go, the students on campus, professors, their friends, uh, they may have friends that go to another university or go to Rutgers. Uh, they feel it, they hear it, they sense it. And so when you have them in practice, I mean, it, it is a little bit more important. And when you look at our schedule every year, I'm sure everyone that's involved in the state of New Jersey, involved with Big East basketball, involved with Seton Hall, and maybe with Rutgers, that they would kind of look at that, where is that game? When, when is that game going to be played? Even though you try to prepare them as a coach, down the road, each and every ball game, you prepare the same. But I think the intensity about our players, I know, and I'm sure Rutgers will be the same way, it's going to be at a high level. Just real quickly, is it possible that maybe to a certain extent, the importance in terms of bragging rights and or recruiting implications might be a little bit overstated on everybody's part. I think so, Scott. I think those things get blown out of proportion. I think people like to talk about that, but we know that one game is not going to make a program, especially when you're going to play each other so many times and you're going to see each other so many times. You're going to compete at so many things, not just uh, you know, with the ball game when you pitch it up at, at noon on Sunday. It's going to be important, obviously, for a lot of different reasons and, and to feel good about ourselves if, if we can pull that win out. But I think it's, uh, it's blown out of proportion when you think about, well, this team is now is going to have the recruiting bragging rights or have the recruiting rights within the state. Time now for our Lincoln Mercury Dealers Drive and Score Play of the Week. Having a great year, but they lose to Seton Hall today, 57 to 55. Alabama. And I think Kevin's done a great job. Rutgers is in. All right, let's continue with the scores, and we'll go to your comment. In college basketball, it was the New Jersey shootout over at the Meadowlands today. Big East basketball, Seton Hall edge Rutgers 57 to 55. Take a look at the highlights of this contest. Kevin Bannon and the Scarlet Knights. Oh, they're all smiles right now. First half, Dwayne Jordan with the block. All on the break, Gary Sanders going to the iron. That is X and one. Pirates up 27-25 at the half. Second half, Shaheen Holloway with the feed to Dwayne Jordan. Jordan for the bucket, and he's fouled, but he missed a free throw. 34-27, Seton Hall. It's all Pirates. Ty Shine says, what's that? Shot clock running down. No problem. A little prayer with an answer. 47-34, Pirates in front. Scarlet Knights, however, they stayed in until the end. Jeff Billett, 10 points, long bomb from downtown. That's three ball. Rutgers cuts it to two. And then in the waning seconds, Rutgers with a chance to tie or win, but Rob Hodgson loses control. Seton Hall holds on to win this one, 57-55. Late. All right, what's the lowdown on Rutgers? Hopes of making it to the NCAA tournament may be a distant memory for Rutgers. That's after losing three straight games. The latest, a 57-53 loss to Georgetown last night in Piscataway. Boy, that was an awful lot like the Seton Hall game the other night. And uh, that's scary when you don't learn your lessons, at, particularly at this time in the season. You know, you deserve what you get. Deserve it or not, Rutgers finds itself in a nightmarish slump at the wrong time of the season. With another capacity crowd on hand at the rack, the Scarlet Knights continue the kind of play against Georgetown that now has them on a three-game losing streak. Poor shooting, sloppy ball handling, teamed with tough defense by the Hoyers, added up to just 20 points for the Scarlet Knights in the first half. Tough to watch, you know, this has been a team that's really overachieved for 90% of the season, and right now they're just struggling. Nobody wants to play that poorly offensively, uh, but, you know, we're doing a lot of standing around looking at each other, and we're really struggling with, with things offensively right now. After falling behind 13 points in the second half, Rutgers did stage a comeback and managed to tie the game with just over a minute left on a Dante Jones three-pointer. But they would need another three to tie with two seconds left. However, Rob Hodgson's shot rimmed out. 
resulting in another disappointing loss for the Scarlet Knights, who now seem more destined for the NIT than the NCAAs. Yeah, the easy thing is, I guess, to give up now. And, you know, you can't do that. You know, we still we have 17 wins right now, and we still have at least two games left. So, you know, there's no reason to, uh, you know, pack in the season yet. The loss drops Rutgers to excuse me, 17 and 10 overall, 9 and 8 in the Big East with its final game in Miami, Miami on Saturday. That's a tough one. The Rutgers women have a cruise to. the stretch we come. Hello again everyone, I'm Bruce Beck. Welcome to the Kevin Bannon Show. This week the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers face Red Hot Miami. The Big East Tournament is just around the corner and even though the Scarlet Knights have lost three in a row, they are still hoping to get an NCAA tournament bid. Kevin, where are those thumbs I gave you early in the season? <laughs> Nobody said it was going to be easy. This is a tough league from top to bottom. You've got to bring your best every night. We didn't do that last week, but thank goodness we're still in the hunt. And you still have opportunities here with a game at Miami, and you know the tournament, an area where maybe you'll have to win two ball games. Well, that's it. You know, we have to do it the hard way. We didn't control our destiny the way we would have liked to, but, you know, there's games out there to play, and uh, I like our chances. Let's take a look at the week that was and begin our recap with the Battle of New Jersey. Rutgers taking on Seton Hall. And when you two teams get together, it's always special. It really was. I mean, this was a special one. Great crowd. People getting there early, camping out. It was a lot of fun. And uh, both teams playing in a very important basketball game in late February. Jeff Billet. What kind of range is that? Well, Jeff's always ready to play, and he certainly brought a lot to the table. And uh, this, this kid knows that he's only got a handful of games left, and he's really playing like it. Rutgers up. 16 to 15, Billet with three three-point field goals in the ball game. Jeff Greer gets it to Rob Hodgson. Nice move. Yeah, that was a good move by Rob down on the baseline. We need more of that from Rob. That's where he did a lot of that early in the year. We haven't seen that a lot lately. Chucky Moore is coming out for the Pirates. He had 13 in the ball game and a couple of threes. He played a great game. Chuck uh, really becoming quite a player for them. Deep threes, takes it to the rim. Good, solid player. Jeff Greer with 15 in the ball game. Rutgers trying to get the ball to Hotsa, but a terrific block there by Jordan. Yeah, Jordan made a good play. We had a chance to get an uncontested layup, and instead we get a block shot. We go down and they get a three-point play. Pretty, play. pretty big play in the game. 27-25, the hall at the break. Second half, Jordan, I don't think he called it. He goes glass. 11-0 run for Seton Hall, and you had to try to stop that uh, the big surge. Well, that was, to me, the difference in the game, because even though we did make that run at the end, uh, you know, we did, We kind of ran out of gas. They, they did a great job of starting the second half. Rutgers down 52-40 at one point, but you hang in there, Coach, and you battle back. Yeah, we sure did. I mean, I think our kids hung in there, and we really earned our breaks and, and made some big shots where we weren't doing earlier in the game and got ourselves right back with a chance to win this thing. And Jeff Billett gets free, and he buries the three-point field goal to cut it to two. Yeah, that was that was huge. We thought right there that might be the one that could get us over the hump, but you've got to give Seton Hall credit here. You forced a lot of shots shot clock violations. Yeah, you know, our defense lately has been good enough to win games. It's where we've sputtered is on offense, and uh, that's where we've got to just turn it up a notch. Are you timeout? 21 seconds left. What are you hoping to do, Coach? Uh, we ran a little set here, and we looked for a di little different option for Rob. We were hoping he'd nail a three there, and if he didn't, take it strong to the rim, and unfortunately, we got neither there, but uh, you have to credit Seton Hall with defending it well. Shaheen Holloway knocks it off of Rob's leg. It goes out of bounds. 57-55. The Hall wins it. Now Let's move ahead to senior night at the rack. You're going to have to say goodbye to Hodson and Billet. Uh, it was a wonderful scene to watch those two guys get the ovation they had in the pregame ceremony. They deserve it, and our crowd was fantastic. And Rob was into the flow early on with the bucket there. George set up 13 to 7. Billet drives, pulls up. We've seen that a number of times. Yeah, he's, he's, see, that's where Jeff's done a great job. Hits the long range jumpers, but much better now getting into the lane and making plays. And a good look to Kent. Yeah, that's we needed that penetration. Unfortunately, Jeff was the only one that did that consistently all night long. And now he'll look again and find Hodgson. If he gets people into the flow, you got to be happy. Yeah, that's that's his role, you know, in addition to being a guy that can put some scoring numbers up there, he's got to get other people involved, and he's done that quite well. But once again, Rutgers playing catch-up. Nat Burton hits the jumper. It's 
18 Hoyas. Yeah, that's been our problem. Uh, again, our defense was good enough. We just weren't scoring the basketball enough to uh, to fight these guys off, and, and they got a comfort level in our gym that you don't want to see somebody else get. And Georgetown goes on a pretty good run, 13 to 6. Anthony Perry hits the three. It's now an 11-point lead for the Hoyas, and time is starting to wind wind down. It's not in your favor. A lot of similarities to the Seton Hall game. Right. I mean, they we let them get off to a good start in the second half, and and we just battled back, and we were right there, but just could get over the hump. And Earl Johnson did a good job in bringing some energy to the game. Yeah, our offense picked up in the, in the, at the end of the game where we penetrated the kind of things we needed all game long. Here Earl makes a great strip and gets a dunk, and, you know, we feel we felt like right there we had a shot at this thing, but you got to credit them. Georgetown made some big plays. So you're right back in it. It's a two-point ball game, and here's Earl pulling up, looking for the jumper, starting to feel it, and it's good, and a foul, a three-point field goal. Unfortunately, Kent misses two free throws. Then Craig Esherick gets teed up. A lot of things going on here down the stretch, Coach. Yeah, there's, we had our opportunities right there. Dante buries a three, puts us right there, and I just thought for sure right there we could win this game. And unfortunately, this play right here kills you. We get we, we had a chance to get Rashad. I think a pretty good shot right there, and the pass is a little off the money. And uh, you got to give Georgetown credit. They've certainly a much better team than we played earlier in the basketball season. Rutgers with another chance here. Needs a three at the final play of the game. Yeah, Rob got a good look. He it, did. It was in and out, but uh, too late. Just too late. And uh, you got to play better basketball early. All right, here's some of the notables from this past week. Jeff Greer against Seton Hall had a solid offensive game. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff Greer played well in that game. Georgetown game got in a little bit of foul trouble. Against the Hoyas, Earl Johnson was terrific with 14 points, a couple of assists. Rob Hodson, the last couple of games, typical Hodson, doing a lot of things well, including stealing the ball. Dante Jones, I thought the fact that he hadn't made a field goal the whole game, and he makes that big one in the last one to tie it at 53, shows his tenacity. Yeah, says something about Dante. I mean, that's the kind of player he is. Uh, he's not considered a great shooter. He makes big shots, and he's, he's going to have some career in a Rutgers uniform. You know, you look at a season, you look at games that come down to the wire, and it can determine whether you have two or three more wins or two or three more losses. Yeah, that's what happens. We've won some close ones. We've gone on the road and gotten some victories. But for whatever reason, we're struggling with our confidence. Not a good time of year to be struggling with confidence. Too many teams playing for too many big things. And uh, we just have to pick it back up over this last week. And I know you, you're, you're really not down, are you? No, I'm not down <laughs> at all, actually. I mean, we, this is what you play for. It's exciting. you know. So we've let a few opportunities get away, but we've played ourselves into a position we can still be an NCAA tournament team. So we've, we've got to take advantage of that. Well, the next game for the Scarlet Knights is indeed a challenge. The red-hot Miami Hurricanes, who right now might be the best team in the Big East. We'll preview that ball game when we return. What's now very good. 20-5 and five overall in conference play. The record 14-3, and three, including 8-1 and one on the road and Kevin Banner there might not be a better team in the league right now. No, they're playing great great basketball and uh, they've earned the distinction of being I think the hottest team, the team that's moved up the farthest in the rankings, uh, just about knocking on top 10 status and uh, you know they're, they're a difficult team. I think they can go very far in the NCAAs. So Rutgers takes on Miami at 12 noon this Saturday in a key ball game for the Scarlet Knights at the Miami Arena. Leonard Hamilton, their head coach in the ninth year at the school, he's done a very good job. It's the most wins they've had since 1965. And Kevin, I know you think a lot of Tim James, their senior forward. Yeah, I think he's had a great year, as, as good a year as anyone in the league. He can step out and hit jump shots, but he finishes around the basket, block shots. Uh, kids really stepped up this year, and so has the rest of his team. They will retire his number before your ball game, and only Rick Barry's number has been retired at Miami besides James. Johnny Hemsley, another dangerous weapon. I think one of the most improved players in the Big East. Uh, he's he's a slasher. He can hit the deep three, and he's so good off the dribble. And he plays with more emotion than Tim James. I think the team really follows his lead. And uh, this guy Mario Bland, same thing. A guy that's gotten so much better. He's only about six foot six, but plays about six foot ten. And averaging 11 points at five and a half boards. Vernon Jennings. He's second in the league in assists, averaging about five per game. Yeah, the supporting cast around the, the you know the the young upper class trio there is very very good Jennings can really handle the ball and is a tough defender and and they've got Kevin Houston back from uh, being injured and you know they're, they're they're a very good basketball team 
Houston had a stress fracture in his right foot, so he's back, and he will help their fast break. And John Salmon's also a guy that will help them. So there are weapons, but James is the go-to guy. Definitely. James is the kind of player that can put the team on his back. He can get 30 on you pretty easily, uh, and I think he's a legitimate player of the year candidate in our league this year. All right, Kevin, let's talk about your keys for this ball game because there's a lot of things to worry about. Well, first and foremost, I'd say we have to defensive rebound. I mean, that's been a problem of ours no matter who we've played, but when you're playing Miami with their athleticism and the way they relentlessly attack the glass, you've got to do that. I think secondly, I think they might play the best half-court defense uh, in the league, in a league where there's a lot of that good defense going on. So we've got to execute our offense and take care of the basketball. And the third thing, I just think it's something personal, but contain Hemsley because he's an emotional, fiery leader of their team. James is going to get his, but I find when James and Hemsley play well, they're, they're pretty much unbeatable. So we've got to do a good job on Johnny Hemsley. First in the league in field goal percentage offense, third in the league in field goal percentage defense. That means they're doing it on both ends of the floor. They really are. I think they're very, very well coached and uh, they, they're a good system team. They take enormous pride in their defense and they don't take bad shots. The right guys take the right shots. And, you know, when your basketball team has those kind of qualities, you're going to be 20 and 5 and in the top 10. We've mentioned a couple of times in the show that this is a big ball game because Rutgers is thinking about the NCAA tournament. Here's their resume right now, something to consider as we head very close to Big East tournament time. Scarlet Knights currently 17-10, and non-conference record, very good, schedule solid, RPI ranking still under 40, last 10 games, certainly a consideration for the tournament selection committee, only 6-4. and four. So Kevin, this is one area, we're down the stretch here, either in this Miami ball game or in the Big East tournament, you've got to come up with a W somewhere. Definitely, that's, you know, and that's, le that's legit, I mean, we know that that and you want to be playing your best basketball we've slipped a little bit but we do have an opportunity to get a great win down at Miami and certainly do some damage in the tournament and if you do that or if we do that I believe we're in the tournament and Rutgers needs some energy this coming weekend and there's one guy who's provided energy all season long Joel Salvi will profile him when we come back <laughs> Relentless, ferocious, fiery. Just some of the words to describe Joel Salvi. Oh, you could throw another word in there, electric. When he comes off the bench, the rack is rocky. The 6'7 junior college transfer is enjoying a very solid season. Here's a closer look at Joel Salvi of the Scarlet Knights. <laughs> He does all the little things that make a team a champion. Baseline, beautiful feed underneath to Salvi. He's like, like Dennis Rodman in the NBA. And Salvi, here's Salvi again, yes. He gives 100% out there, and people like them when they see that. Fine spot, a steal by Salvi. He goes all out on the floor, you know. Here's Salvi. Oh! That's the exclamation point for Salvi. Although Joel Salvi isn't a starter, he's proven to be quite an asset to the Scarlet Knights. His outgoing personality and tenacious work ethic on the court has earned him the position of fan favorite. No one's ever showed that much appreciation for the way that I play, the style that I play. And now I think in the Big East, a lot of people were tough and you got a lot of big guys, muscular guys, and just my style of play as if, you know, when I when I get down on the ground, I make dive and plays, I get the rebounds. And I think the cross sees that, and, and I guess there hasn't really been someone like that in the Rutgers program. And, and for me to just come in and make that impact, it, it definitely feels good. As a transfer student from a successful Allegheny College program, Salvi knows how to win. And he uses that knowledge in helping his teammates on the court and on the sidelines. For me to get enthusiastic on the side, jumping up and down, screaming. A lot of time uh, when you're when you're sitting on the side, you can see a lot of the things that you can't really see when you're in the game. And I just try to get my team an edge, you know, let them know, get the rebounds, get on the loose balls, and just I try to I try to be as much as a vocal leader as I am a, a emotional leader playing on the court. Salvi is a throwback player. Back to the time when everyone knew the meaning of the word teamwork, when every loose ball was attacked, when everybody hustled all the time and when they had big hair and wore long socks. Socks are pretty much is just a habit that I've had, you know. And in junior college, I really, I, I played with them up in high school, but in junior college, I, the coaching coach really didn't like it up that high, so I, I conformed to hit what he wanted, and I, I had him down a little bit low. I, I inched him up a little bit during the game. 
But now I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm more or less allowed to have them up and just, I, I don't really think about it, you know, when I, when I put everything on, I just pull my socks up and I just, I just go out there and play. When Joel enters the game, it's as if he like ignites the whole team with like his rebounds and his, his steals and the way that he just plays defense, it just stirs the whole crowd up and gets everybody into the game more. Like he doesn't always score like the most points, but he does a lot of little things that um, help the team out all the time. I like him because he works hard. He hustles a lot on the court. Uh, he doesn't get that. He didn't get that much playing time. He's out of the starting players, but I like the way he plays. He goes hard for everything. I don't know. He just works hard. He's like a wake-up call every game. I mean, if we're playing sluggish, he comes out, makes a couple of good plays, and just gets us up for the rest of the game. And, and it's great to have somebody like that on the team. He's a coach's player, a teammate's inspiration, and fittingly, the Rutgers fan favorite. A coach's player, is that fair to say? Definitely. I mean, he is a throwback. He's a guy that... Uh, you know, we, when we recruited him, the role that he's playing is exactly the role that we envisioned for him. Come in, dive on the floor, be an inspirational leader. Um, you know, everybody loves him, and this is exactly what we wanted for Joel when he got to Rutgers. I knew he was cut from a different mold on Midnight Madness when he started to come over and go, Arr! and I had never even met the guy before. Yeah, it didn't take long for our fans, uh, Midnight Madness, to find out we had a guy that was a little bit different. I tried, <laughs> yeah. I tried to warn them, but uh, when you see him play, they realize that he's different. And what I'm excited about, Bruce, is that my thing is next year he can expand on this role, all, this, all these nice things that he does for us, and I think he can score more. He's a better shooter than people think. He's a good foul shooter, so it's pretty exciting. His upside is pretty exciting. Hoop of the Week is brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts, and Joel Salvi helps us out this week in giving us the big play to look back on. Kevin, let's go to the Georgetown game. Well, with, with, with Joel, you know, again, what I was just talking about is he's so quick to the rim. In addition to being a, a great athlete, he's just got great instincts. So right there, Earl's feed becomes a dunk before you know it, and that's our Hoop of the Week. There it is, the Salvi Jam, and that is the Dunkin' Donuts Hoop of the Week. Coming up next to the Kevin Bannon Show, we'll talk about the Big East Conference because it's starting to get interesting with the tournament at MSG just around the corner. Stay with us. Square Garden next Wednesday with five ball games. That's right, four days of fury. If you love hoops, you ought to be there. Right now, our trip around the Big East Conference, and it's brought to you by New Jersey Transit. Here's Ken Henderson. Saturday, the Miami Hurricanes became only the third team to go 8-1 on the road in the Big East Conference since the expansion in 1991 with a 73-71 win at UConn. Johnny Hemsley scored 19, Tim James and Mario Bland scored 16 apiece to help the Canes earn their 19th victory of the season. UConn's Khaled El Amin had a chance to tie the game in the closing seconds, but he lost his footing and the Huskies lost for only the second time this year. Mike Jarvis made it a triumphant return home when St. John's defeated the Hoyas on Saturday in the nation's capital. LeVar Postel had 18 points and 15 rebounds, and Eric Barkley scored seven points in the final 129 to give the Johnnies their 13th conference win. Sunday, the UCLA Bruins proved to be just too much for the Syracuse Orangemen. The Bruins' Baron Davis tied his career high with 27 points and keyed UCLA in the second half, where they outscored Syracuse by 20 points. The loss dropped the Orange to 18 and 9 for the season. Monday night, the Yukon Huskies moved a step closer to winning their fifth regular season Big East title in the last six years with a win at Providence. Richard Hamilton had 25 points and three assists to lead UConn. The win assured the Huskies of at least a share of the Big East regular season crown. UConn can win the title outright with a victory on Sunday at Syracuse. Tuesday night, Villanova went out of conference to face longtime rival Penn. The Quakers jumped out to an early lead, but Brian Lynch's 17 points coupled with a second-half 14-3 run by Nova, earned the Wildcats victory number 19 on the season. In other action Tuesday night, the Miami Hurricanes earned their 20th win of the year by trouncing Pittsburgh 85-52. 
Tim James had 20 points to lead the Canes to their first 20-win season in 34 years. And that's our trip around the Big East. So, Kevin, the big three right now with pretty impressive records. Yeah, I mean, there are three of the top probably 12 teams in the country. Uh, all have gotten better. I think Connecticut, a little bit of a struggle, but I think they'll snap out of it. So the league will be represented well. And obviously the big focus for you guys right now, try to get that fourth or fifth seed overall for the tournament, right? Well, that's that's what it's all about right here. We want to try to, we feel like we've earned that. And, and we want to, there's a big difference between being, a, say, a fourth or a fifth seed or a sixth or a seventh seed is very much a different path to success. So uh, we want to get that fourth or fifth seed. You're not surprised that it's come down to the last week of the season, are you? No, not the way this year's been. I mean, there's a fine line that separates teams. Several teams have stepped up. A couple teams like ourselves have struggled a little bit. But uh, it's, it was going to be a battle right to the end. I'm not surprised a bit. Now, the RPI rankings are very important for the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee. Here's the numbers right now in the Big East, and a lot of those teams are kind of on the bubble when you look at Villanova, Rutgers, Syracuse, and Providence. And, Kevin, they've, they've looked at this for a number of years, whether you believe in it or not, and they also look at how you finish, how, how you end up, what you are in your last 10. Yeah, well, what you have to do is you have to finish strong. And it doesn't really matter what our RPI is. We have to win a couple of games in the tournament or get a win down at Miami, and we know what we have to do. And, and uh, I think our kids are certainly capable of getting that done. It's similar to a boxer. If you knock the guy out, you don't have to worry about going to the decision. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I think, you know, that's true. And, and we've um, lost some opportunities to control our destiny, but not all of them. And that's what we have to do. We have to go out and get some wins. And when you look at this Miami Hurricane team, you're going on the road. They're saying Miami's good at home. Hey, sometimes when everyone is looking one way, you can sneak up on somebody a little bit. Well, I think we have it in us. I mean, we've beaten, what, four or five top 20 teams over the last year and a half of my tenure and I think this team has the resolve to go get a game like that done and uh, you know maybe maybe Miami looks past us but all I know is I think our guys will be ready to play and certainly ready to accomplish something in the Big East tournament. All right some final thoughts coming up on the Kevin Bannon show in just a moment. Regular season game for the Scarlet Knights, hard to believe, but the season has gone that quickly. Rutgers in Miami to take on the Hurricanes, that ball game Saturday at 12 noon. We've talked a lot about it today. Rutgers 17-10, 9-8 in conference play. And Kevin, is it hard to believe that the season is just gone? Yeah, it really is. Uh, it's, it's gone quickly when you have the kind of competition. And the way the league's been, it just seems to fly by because you're always looking at that next night and you're playing every other night and, you know, it's, it's, it's just been that kind of year. Well, don't forget, summer just around the corner now. That means Kevin Bannon's basketball camp, and I'm really chomping at the bit, Coach. Yeah, even our spring session we have for, for young uh, kids, we have a spring session when they're off for Easter break. So I look forward to the camp. It's a great way to interact with the kids in the summertime. We have a lot of fun with it. And I know you'd like to talk to the kids about what you accomplished this year, so these next couple of weeks will determine what your tone is with those youngsters. Yeah, and they could be tough, so we better accomplish something <laughs> or they'll be our worst critics. <laughs> Good luck, Coach. We'll see you next week. All right, thanks, Bruce. All right, that's it for the Kevin Bannon Show. We'll see you next week, everybody, to recap Miami and preview the Big East Tournament. What's the lowdown on Rutgers, which has lost three straight? Uh, I think I know a lot of people have said they've killed themselves, and now they put a lot of pressure on themselves in the Big East tournament. I really believe that uh, when they play Miami on Saturday, that helps them in the RPI win or lose because Miami is such a highly rated team. So that game's not going to really affect them. It'd be great if they win it, then they're definitely in. I think if they win their first game in the Big East tournament, they're still going to get in because when you look at it and you try to fill these these slots in in the conference in, in the uh, brackets, you know, do you want the third place team from the Missouri Valley or the sixth place team from the Big East? 
you know, and I think when you break it down and look at who they played, and don't forget, Rutgers, a big credit now that no one thought early in the season, they played Auburn. Right. And, and that's huge for them in their RPI. They get all that credit for everything Auburn's done, and that becomes a big win for them. I think that even though they've stumbled a little bit here at the end, they were close games, they weren't blown out, and I think the committee will look at that, and then they'll say to themselves, these guys deserve to be in. I don't know what kind of seating they're going to get. They could be, you know, double digits even, but they'll be down. Uh, I think they'll get in. But very rarely do we see a, a team that even finishes fifth or sixth in the Big East, the SEC, the Pac-10 that is lower than 10th in the overall seedings. That's right. right. It, it, that is rare, but it has happened, and uh, and they can still do it that way. And and you know, one of the things people have to realize, talking to these guys in the committee room, and, and, and I'm fascinated by this whole thing, and that's why I always pick these guys' brains, and especially when someone leaves the committee, you know, then they're willing to talk a little bit more. One of their big problems is that, that they have to move people, sometimes as many as two lines. So you could see a team seated 11th that was really meant to be in ninth, but they had to move them for different reasons, to get them away from a conference opponent, to get them away out of a a site that they couldn't play in on a certain day. So those aren't etched in stone. You can't just say that the last team listed as an at-large was the last team in. They might have been in there ahead of other teams, but they had to move them around for seating purposes. Going back to Rutgers for just a moment, we were talking all week you know, about the two victories that they would need. You say only one, and again, you're looking at strength of schedule and RPI. Are those two I, the considerations? I mean, their RPI, you know, they're still in the high 20s, uh, which is a great number. Uh, usually anybody that, that's lower than 40 is almost guaranteed getting in if you're from one of the power conferences, and obviously the Big East is this year. I think the Big East is right there. If, if you use the criteria of, of top six teams from each league, I think they're as good as anybody. And uh, You know, they, they did have a couple of tough games down, down the road, but the teams they lost to, you know, uh, aren't bad teams. They're teams that are still going to get them quality points and make a difference, and uh, I, I think they're going to get in. You like the job Bannon's done? I think he's done a tremendous... I, I think the thing that's most amazing about Kevin is that when he came in, I think we all sat back and said, okay, it's going to take him four years, you know, maybe maybe even five years. To get his the, own guys. The yep. way he's come out of the gate and the way he is just, he's done it on the court, he's done it on the recruiting front. There's, Rutgers people couldn't ask more of a coach in his first two years and Kevin Bannon has done. I think it's just an amazing job. All right, we're going to take a break and we're going to open up. Very good. Um, I just have a quick question about Rutgers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> even though they have, they're probably going to have like a, um, like 500 uh, conference record, right? And maybe only like 18 wins in the regular season. Do you honestly think they still have a good shot at the tournament? Well, let's let's get you caught up because we talked a little bit at the top of the show. Jim, give your opinion because we often share ours. Yeah, no, I think that uh, you know people have to realize when you're in the Big East, 18 wins is a big number, and and that's a number good enough to get in with their RPI they have. I think if they win one game the rest of the way, either find a way to upset Miami, which would be almost impossible, or win their first game in the Big East tournament, they're in the NCAA tournament. Even though the way they're playing right now, they're kind of slumping along because I've been to every game. Game. Yeah, and it, like they're they're not playing very well right now. No, they're not. But they, they were still right there. They lost a couple of tough games. Uh, you have to realize, you know, the Seton Hall game was on the road. The, the committee takes that in consideration. Uh, so I, I think they're sitting in good shape. When you have an RPI as low as theirs, you're in, you're in better shape than you realize. Okay, so Scarlet Knights fans, uh, keep the faith and hope for a win against Miami or a win in the tournament in the opening round. And last year, Rutgers made it to the semifinals of the Big East tournament for the first time ever on that great shot by Jeff Billett. Neil in Fanwood. Neil? Hey, Bruce. How you doing? Good, Neil. Quick question, uh, specifically about Rutgers, but more along the lines of the Big East. Let's just say, I, I don't like to go by hypotheticals, but if, with the schedule the way it is the last weekend, if Rutgers were to go to Miami and lose, and let's say a Seton Hall were to go to Pitt and win, Seton Hall would theoretically finish higher in the Big East. Would Rutgers still have a chance to go to the NCAA tournament? Yeah, one thing that the committee will tell you uh, when you talk to them is that conference record is not one of the things they look at. That every regular season champion gets put up on the board, on the at-large board, right. and then everyone else, your conference record's thrown out the window. You're just now another team trying to get into the tournament. So if you finish third, you're not necessarily better than the team that finished fifth. If the team that finished fifth had a lot better non-conference schedule than you did, they can still work their way in. So, so it's know, conceivable I mean, they both could end up with nine and nine conference records, and I guess the first tiebreakers head to head, right? Head to head. And so for the conference tournament, that'll make a difference. But, uh, you know, and, and when you think of the job Tommy Amaker has done this year, I think he's done an incredible job, uh, you know, with the talent he has there, and with the injuries. the injuries he's gone through. I think he's done a spectacular job, and they've clinched themselves an NIT bid. Uh, they're two games over 500 right now, even if they were to lose the, the game at Pitt and lose their first game in the tournament, they'd be 500. That'll get you in the NIT. A couple of quick teams. Uh, your thoughts just... The goal, get in the dance and avoid hearing the sad sentences that go with being left out.
Well, I think we would have liked to have seen maybe one more win. Ryan Robertson can win it, and he was fouled. He was fouled by Peterson. Maybe one more win. Collier wants to go against Morris, and Morris shuts him down again. I'd like to have seen one more quality win. Heading into the conference tournaments, over 40 teams were still in the running for about half as many spots in the field of 64. More than a few come from conferences used to getting several into the party. After the big three, Duke, Maryland, and Carolina, there might be room for one more from the ACC. Three teams, Georgia Tech, NC State, and Wake Forest, are all hovering just above 500. Now, Wake Forest has 15 wins going into the weekend. Last year, they had 16 wins, yet did not get into the field of 64. Wake has one thing firmly in their favor. They are the only team other than Kentucky and Duke to beat Maryland. The SEC's shown what big wins can do. Arkansas's back-to-back -back victories over top 10 teams give them 20 wins and a sure bid. Ole Miss and in-state rival Mississippi State will need to do the same in the SEC tournament. Two Eastern Leagues also have teams waiting in line. The Atlantic 10 had five bids in each of the last two years. Temple's 19 wins should make them a lock. Rhode Island, second in the A-10 East, needs to make the conference final to get a bid after being hurt by early non-conference losses and a slow A-10 start. With 20 wins, Xavier sits atop the A-10 West, tied with George Washington, which still needs to avoid an early turning exit. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I opened up my big mouth and said 18 would probably get us in, but I don't want the players thinking that. It may be, but you know, I'd like to get, get uh, every win we can possibly get, maybe get to, to the conference finals, and who knows, once you get to a championship game, anything can happen. The Big East has two teams holding trump cards. Villanova has wins over bubble mates Rutgers and Syracuse. The Orangemen beat then number one UConn. Rutgers may be the odd team out, the victim of a weak non-conference slate and a late season losing streak. Much of the talk in the Midwest centers around how much space the Big Ten will take up, but the drama will be in Big 12 country. Kansas and regular season champ Texas are breathing easy. Missouri, Oklahoma, and Nebraska, all shy of 20 wins, aren't. And Oklahoma State, once favored, may be running out of breath. They have not performed well all season long. They have been upset victims to teams that they should have beaten, teams like Creighton and Florida International. Oklahoma State has to get to the final or win the Big 12 tournament in order to be invited to the NCAA tournament. Among the mid-majors, a lot of chances for more than one bid. The Mid-America is expected to send two, selected from Toledo, Kent, and Miami of Ohio, each with 19 or more wins. Conference USA is looking at possibly three bids. While Louisville's strong schedule gives them the inside track, UNC Charlotte has just as many wins, including an upset of Cincinnati. UAB leads the conference's national division. Many of those bids may come at the wax expense. After Utah comes wounded hopefuls UNLV, TCU, and low RPI-rated long shots Tulsa and New Mexico. In the middle lie Jerry Tarkanian's Bulldogs. Fresno State, I think, has some of the best talent, especially in the backcourt of any team in the country, but they have not performed consistently and I think have to do something spectacular in the WAC tournament. Better to hear that now than spending March hearing this. I think we would have liked to have seen maybe one more win. <laughs> Three winners over the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers. Miami forward Tim James honored before the game. His number retired, and then the Hurricanes came out running. On the move, Salmons to Hemsley. Nice finish in transition. Then Tim James can get it done in the paint, throwing it down inside. James and Salmons help extend the Miami lead. They connect for the alley-oop. Time running down. Scarlet Knights had their last effort spoiled by Miami's Tim James. He gets the block on the three-point attempt and Miami survives Rutgers 68 to 63. In the Big Ten. Rutgers and Miami Rutgers, of course, we've been talking about this, trying to get the last hopes in. NCAA tournament trying to end a losing streak, but in Miami, Miami winning seven in a row coming in, and Tim James, you saw his jersey being retired, you see his jumper being knocked down, second half, more from Miami. Tim James up in the air and knocks that down. Yikes, Miami just too tough. This one did get close late. 68-63 is the final, and Rutgers in big trouble. Yeah, four straight losses for Rutgers really hurts when you look at what they need to do to get in, and this really hurts, I think, Rutgers' chances right now. They've got to do well in the Big East tournament, and you see how they are against top 25 teams, only one in five. So Rutgers losing to Seton Hall on the road, then coming home and losing to Georgetown last week. Those two losses hurt. There was a tough way for them to win today. Meantime, Georgetown.
The garden will be rocky. Hello again, everyone. I'm Bruce Beck. Welcome to the Kevin Bannon Show. Here we go. It's tournament time in the Big East. It all opens on Wednesday with five opening round games. It concludes on Saturday night with the championship game at 8 o'clock at the Garden. Scarlet Knights of Rutgers, they open up with the Pitt Panthers on Wednesday night at 9.30. Hope you got all that. Coach Bannon, this is the time of year you look forward to. You sure do. I mean, whether you're Rutgers or any other team, it's a new season for you. And we certainly are excited about our opportunity to go into that Big East tournament and make some noise. Do you expect that building to be rocking? Oh, I think it's going to be great. There's nothing better than the Big East tournament in Madison Square Garden. I know all the teams get excited, but I think it's even more special for local teams. I mean, we know that we'll get a strong contingent up there in the crowd and lots of support, and uh, we'll be ready to go. All right, let's look back for a moment, if we might. Rutgers taking on Miami, final regular season game of the 1998-99 campaign. This game at Miami Arena. Tim James honored before the game. First player to have his number retired since Rick Barry. And Rutgers came roaring out of the gate. Yeah, we started well, which was important because we've been struggling with our confidence. Our kids really came out ready to play. It was an emotional game for Miami. Senior day, Tim James' number being retired. So we started very, very well. And you open up with an 8-2 lead. Jeff Billick going strong to the hoop. Yeah, we had some of the offensive confidence and execution that was lacking in the last couple of games. And Miami, I think, is the best half-court defensive team in the conference, so it was good to see. I know you want Hodgson to take that shot. He finished with 13 points. Well, Rob's not an easy guy to figure out. You know, he made his open threes, but he had some opportunities that he just couldn't take. I thought you had some very good defensive plays. There's the block by Dante Jones. Here's a play, kind of like bowling, where <laughs> Billet ends up with a bloody nose, but you get the offensive foul. Well, well, that's, the, that's been our team trademark. When we play that kind of rugged basketball with the defense and the charges and the activity, we've been pretty darn good, and we've gotten away from that a little bit lately. Miami stayed close, mostly on free throws, but here Earl finds Jeff Greer with a three. Greer four for eight from downtown. I thought Jeff Greer played about as good a game as he's played in our uniform. He, he slashed and got to the rim. He hit deep threes. He just played a great floor game for us. Off the inbounds play, Earl will find Rashad Kent. A little bit of a doghouse situation for him. Him, huh? Well, not really. Rashad, we needed to mix things up. I think Rashad and Dante have been a little bit flat like freshmen can be late in the year, and I just thought it would be good to let them watch for a few minutes and come in off the bench, and I thought they did a good job. Miami up at the half, 32-27. Oh, what a move by Greer. Great finish because the shot blocker came over and he still shot it over him. Greer had 22 in the ball game on 10 for 16 shooting. Mario Blam was solid. He had 10 points and 12 boards, and Johnny Salmons can't leave him wide open. Nah, that, this is a spurt here that really hurt us because we spent the rest of the night trying to come back. They, they started the half so well. They executed their offense. They were disruptive defensively. And, uh, hey, they're a great team, probably as hot as any team in the league or a country for that matter. Kevin, Miami goes up by 17, but uh, you battled back. Good signs for our basketball team. That's why I left Miami feeling pretty good about ourselves. I thought at both ends of the court, we stepped up and we made this into a war. And it's unfortunate we didn't pull it out, but I think our kids really did some good things down the stretch. So you come right back into the ball game and hit it to 56-50 in this three by Earl. Yeah, Earl hit a, a nice three. Greer hit a nice three. You know, we got some things in transition, which we haven't gotten a lot of lately, so it was real good to see. They go back up by as many as nine. Johnny Hemsley, who had a solid ball game. Also, Alvitas Tanise for you with a tip in here. I thought V gave us some good minutes. You know, he was big, he was active and strong, and he didn't play a ton of minutes, but when he was in there, he was involved. Now Greer cuts the lead to three, and the slicing move to the hoop with a minute 45 four to go, but here's the big sequence, end of the ball game, Rutgers comes up with the steal, Jeff Billet to the front court, Tim James with the block, you get the ball back, Billet gets the ball back, and again, Tim James is there for the block. Yeah, I mean, our kids did everything that they had to do in that situation to give yourself a chance to win, and what you have to do is just say Miami's a terrific team, and they just came up with big plays. Tim James might be the player of the year in our league, and he played like it in the last minute there. You think he's expended too much energy just getting back in the game? Well, you, you do a lot of times, you know, and that's been our problem. We've lost four straight, and three of the four, we've come all the way back, had the shot to either tie or put the ball, put the game ahead, and we, we weren't able to do that. Greer was terrific in this ball game. Rob Hodson had 13 points and eight boards in 33 minutes, and Jeff Billett 
nine points and four steals in 35. It was a game you could have had. Again, there have been a number of games like this this year, Kevin, and it doesn't matter if they're number one, two, or three in the league, or at the bottom, you end up with some close games. Yeah, lately we just can't get over the hump, I, but I do like the way we played down at Miami. I do think our confidence is back. I feel great about our team going into the Big East tournament, and the attitude that we're taking is let's go in there with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, not like last year where, you know, you're happy to be there, let it all hang out. Here, I think we have something to prove, and I think our guys will be ready to go. And you have something to prove because you need that W to show the NCAA Tournament Committee that you are a team that deserves to be in the Final 64. Time for the segment entitled, Why It Worked. We go back to the Miami ball game for a moment. Why It Worked, brought to you by the Rutgers Court Club. And Kevin, this is an inbounds play, and kind of set up because Jeff Greer was so hot. Yeah, exactly. Jeff had hit a couple of threes, so we set a play up, and we kind of used him as a decoy, and we got Rashad a dunk. And uh, everybody executed very well. It starts out with Jeff setting his man up, coming off a double screen. Rob does a real good job of making a good, strong, wide base, okay? Then, then you have Rashad coming over. He's going to set the second screen, but it's a decoy. So everybody pays attention to Jeff Greer, who now is coming off the screen. And you see Rashad, he doesn't hold his screen. What he does is it's a, it's a little, what we call a slip screen. He goes towards it, comes back. And, uh, you know, we executed well. Earl gave him a very good pass as well. And you like to get Kent inside where he can use his muscle. Well, you got to have that kind of balance. And when your shooters are making threes, you can make plays like this because they have to respect someone like Jeff Greer. Why it worked brought to you by the Rutgers Court Club. And obviously, when things go well on the outside, it sets up things on the inside and conversely the other way. Definitely. And uh, I hope next week at this time we have tons of things to choose from <laughs> for the Why It Works segment. So we don't have to go searching, right? No, not at all. We've been searching lately. <laughs> next week, we're going to have plenty of highlights for you. All right. I hope you're right, Coach. We'll take a short break. Coming up next, we'll look at the Pitt Panthers' first-round opponent for the Scarlet Knights in the Big East Tournament. of Rutgers open up the Big East Tournament with the Pitt Panthers, a Pittsburgh team, by the way, that's playing better, Kevin, right now. Oh, definitely. I think they're on a little bit of a mission for Ralph Willard, and a uh, very good team. You know, Fontigo Cummings is an all-league player, I mean, maybe a pro, so uh, we know we have our work cut out for us. All right, this ball game will take place on Wednesday. It's the last of five games on the slate that day in the Big East. Panthers are 14 and 15, 5 and 13 in conference play. Scarlet Knights 17, 11, and 9 and 9 in league play. Bontigo Cummings, you didn't see him the first time you guys went head to head, did you? No, we were lucky. He was out with a back injury, and uh, like I say, he's one of the premier players in the league. So we're going to have to start out by containing him well. And they're a good perimeter team. You know, they have a lot of weapons, a lot of kids that can score the basket ball off the dribble, shoot the three, excellent in transition. Cummings averages 16.4 points per ball game, leads the team with 69 steals. Ricardo Greer played well against the Scarlet Knights. He's tough. I mean, he's a guy that's only about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, but plays so much bigger. He's capable of hitting a three, but he just wreaks havoc. Like on this play, you just see the kid, he's all over the place, can finish in transition, so we've got to keep that guy off the boards. Isaac Hawkins averages almost a double-double, 12.8 points, 8.8 eight boards. Yeah, all league player, tons of double doubles. Uh, when he stays out of foul trouble, their team takes it up a whole nother notch and, and that's a pretty important factor in the game. Jared Lockhart made 37 threes this year and Kelly Taylor made 36. Very, you know, their trademark, I think, is very good perimeter play. There's a lot of kids that can make plays, so if they get you into a chaotic game, they're, 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 they're going to do very well. Here's the bottom half of the bracket. The winner of the Rutgers-Pittsburgh game will take on St. John's, the number three seed. Winner of Providence and Georgetown will meet Miami. The Hurricanes go in as the number two seed overall. And I'll tell you, look all around this tournament. There's some good matchups early, and there could be some very good matchups in the quarterfinals. Great matchups. Uh, I think the balance in the league gets every everyone excited about saying, hey, we can go there and get some damage done. And, and there's a lot of teams going in there with a lot of optimism. Uh, there's very little that separates the teams in this league, and I think it'll be a really exciting tournament. All right, break down the Pittsburgh game for us. Talk about your keys. Well, I think the first thing we have to do is we have to um, defend our perimeter defense. It has to be good because, because of all the kids that can score and make plays off the dribble. We've got to stay in front of people and guard 
you know, second thing, the rebounding is so important for us, and we've got to keep them, you know, off their offensive boards. When we do play good defense, if we're giving up second shots, that really hurts us. And, and the last thing is offensively, I like the way we played down in Miami. We've got to have the same offensive precision and confidence. Uh, Pitt's one of the top teams in the league in terms of forcing turnovers and getting steals. So we have to be strong with the basketball and execute our offense. And you need that execution for 40 minutes, not for 18 or 16 or 14. Exactly, because against a team like Pitt, if you don't take care of the basketball, that fuels their whole offense. They're one of the best teams in the league at taking a bad shot or a turnover and making it into a basket for them. So, you know, that's, we're going to have to really be precise and sharp and strong offensively. Now right, let's go back for a moment to the first meeting of the year between Rutgers and Pittsburgh at the rack. And it was really a situation where you had a good first half and was able to hold on. Yeah, we got off to a good start. We did all the things that we just talked about, all the keys. Guys played well, got out in some transition off of our defense, and then Pitt didn't go away and it became a war. But good things here, we just got them spread out, had some mismatches. Uh, Rob played a good floor game for us, if I'm not mistaken. He had he 20, got 20, 20 yeah. points, you know, he played a good game for us. And, and we had that balance. There's that balance of getting some inside production from people like Joel Salvi and Rashad, and then also some things out in the open court. But you're, you're right they don't about go balance. away. They don't go away. They're a relentless team. It doesn't matter. They're very tenacious, and they're going to go after you. I think the big stat in the first meeting, Coach, you went to the free throw line 30 times. They went only 11. Pretty good indication that we did play strong because they take a lot of chances. They extend their defense. And so, you know, that's another key. If we play strong, we're going to get to the line, and we are one of the better free throw shooting teams in the league. Ricardo Greer did have a very good game in the Battle of Washington Heights, 21 points and 12 boards. When you look at the season stats, I'll tell you, there's not much that separates the two teams. Not at all. And I, it's the point I made before. I think when you're going to throw up the stats of most of the matchups in the Big East tournament, there's very little that separates teams so our team is well aware of our opponent we were playing a tough Pittsburgh team and we better be ready to play basketball all right coming up next Todd Kowalchuk the assistant coach for the Scarlet Knights helps us break down the big ball game coming up against Pitt in the tournament stay with us Welcome back to the Kevin Bannon Show. You know, Kevin Bannon and Todd Kowalczyk are like kindred spirits. They are together often. They've been together as coaches for the past six years. And Todd, it's great to have you on the program to finally see that you guys are not as inseparable as we thought. How you doing, buddy? Doing great. Thanks, Bruce. What about the relationship you guys have built as assistant coach and head coach? And do you know what he's thinking? Does he know what you're thinking all the time? Well, I think you can work with somebody that long. You definitely have a, a relationship that you understand what he likes and he understands how, you know, what I do well. And, you know, it's, it's been great. It's been six years together. And, Without a doubt, it's been a, it's been a great little marriage. And do you end up, oh, a marriage, and do you end up getting mad at him as much as you end up getting mad at your uh, wife? Or? It's, like, it's like a marriage because sometimes it's not good that somebody always knows what you're thinking. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, it's, you start the sentence, he finishes it. But the thing I like about Todd the most is that um, he's his own man, and I think our players really respect that and respond to that, and I think he challenges me you know, in every way, shape, and form. He's not just a yes man. He really challenges me to, you know, basically give me ideas to do the right things. And that's why he's been as successful as he's been. Todd, you feel good about your recruiting efforts, especially in New Jersey over the past couple of years? Oh, we're very happy with that, Bruce. I think the guys we bring in are, are going to make significant impacts for our program. You know, they're good students, good guys, and above all, they really want to be good players, and you can't have enough guys like that. Now, let's focus on the Big East. Pittsburgh, a team you played earlier this year, and you won. As long as you didn't beat them twice, it usually bodes well for a tournament. Thoughts on playing the Panthers? Well, Pitt's definitely a team that is very, very talented. Uh, they have, you know, Ricky Greer, who's somebody who, who hurt us in the first game, and we're going to try to match up with Dante Jones on him a little bit. But he's somebody that scored more so around the basket in offensive rebounding than he did on the perimeter. Uh, so we're, and they're also playing a smaller lineup with, with Cosby being out for the season, they're going to play Ricky Greer probably more at the four, so you might see Rob Hodgson guard him quite a bit also. You like the fact that you had really good balance in your first meeting? Oh, absolutely. We got the ball inside early to Rashad, and that, that got them in foul trouble on the inside, which certainly helped us. And, you know, I think on the perimeter, we had some guys step up and make some big plays down the stretch. When you look at this Pittsburgh ball club, do you think they're playing much better now than they were back then? Oh, I think they're playing with more confidence. And like Coach said earlier, I think they, they're really trying to, to win one here for, for Ralph Willard and go out on a positive note. You know, they're a team that is very, very talented. You know, they have the, the, the senior Ventiga Cummings and some all the guys. 
uh, you know, and Ricky Greer and as well as Isaac Hawkins. Kevin, will you have to break down film in the next few days? Or do you know this team so well from seeing them and playing against them that now it's more focusing on your own house, keeping your own house in order? Well, I think, you know, we, we haven't played at the level that we, we think we should be playing. So obviously we're worried about our own house. But anytime you go into any game, let alone a game of this magnitude, you've got to do your preparation. And that's where Todd's done a great job. This is, we break up the teams. This is one of Todd's teams. And so obviously he has to know them inside and out and help our team get ready for, you know, for this big game. All right, talk a little bit about uh, Todd. You guys have known each other a long time. He's been around at many different universities, and his experience is obviously a plus. Yeah, I think you know, anytime you, you choose assistant coaches, you want guys that, that I think you want guys that want that are going to be great head coaches. I don't want guys around me that just want to stay in that capacity. And I think Todd's preparing himself on a daily basis to be a terrific Division One head coach. He's showing the patience necessary. He's helping us build the program. You see his background. He's been successful everywhere he's been. So, you know, and he's smart enough to be patient. What, I, what bothers me around this time of year is guys are more concerned about their resumes than, than winning conference games and tournament <laughs> games, right? Uh, Todd's a guy that knows where he's, he's going to go, and he's patient, and he has a wisdom that some assistant coaches don't have. The former University of Minnesota Duluth Academic All-America. You probably share some of that wisdom with the guys about the importance of balancing academics with athletics. Oh, it's certainly important to balance it. And I think we have some great guys in our program now who do a great job with that. Rob Hodson being number one and Jeff Bill being number two. They're, they're great leaders for our guys, and they, they show how important getting that degree really is. Good luck to you, Todd. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bruce. All right, time for the Hoop of the Week. We go back to the Miami game, and again, we bring up the play of Jeff Greer. Dunkin' Donuts sponsors the Hoop of the Week. Coach Bannon, take it away. Great finish to her. Well, here we are. We're playing against uh, their man, and Cholo gets a little bit of room in here, and that slashing is so important to, the, to our offense. I mean, what happens is people get out on our shooters, and if you don't have somebody that can break down the defense and get to the rim, it's going to be a long night, and that was a great play against probably the best defensive team in our league. No, I was talking about Jeff Greer. You were talking about Cholo. That's his nickname. I don't know what it means, <laughs> but I think it's clean, so we'll, I'm allowed to use it. I think so, too. Uh, we'll be able to break down the tournament when we come back. We'll take a short break. More coming up on the Kevin Bannon Show. Looking ahead to the big matchups on Wednesday at the Garden. Stay with us. The thing that really scares a coach is the first round matchup in a tournament because you just never know where you're going and if you win that game, Kevin, you can build a lot of momentum. That's it. You know, you can't look past your first round opponent. You can't make these plans like what you're going to do. Win and get confidence and move on and that's what happens in these tournaments. You did last year. You got to the semifinals of the tournament for the first time for the Scarlet Knights and I thought you didn't have a chance to go to the finals at that point. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. You know, we went into it, we've kind of flip-flopped. Last year we're a 12 seed, this year we're a 6 seed and almost a 4th and 5th. And uh, you know, who would have thought that we could get past a West Virginia who was an NCAA caliber team, started six or had six seniors in the rotation. You go and you play the game, and you never know how your opponent's going to take it. Go and be ready and let it all hang out, and then we'll see where it takes you. Here are the final standings in the Big East this year. It ends up with UConn just beating out Miami, St. John's number three, Syracuse winning as the number four seed, then it's Nova, Rutgers number six, and Providence number seven as far as the seedings are concerned, all the way down to Boston College. That's the way things ended up. Obviously, one of the most intriguing games is that 8-9 ball game because you've got Notre Dame against Seton Hall. Even though Notre Dame has won twice this year, I just think at the Garden, that's going to be a heck of a ball game. I agree with you. I think Seton Hall is playing very good basketball right now. They almost swept their last trip out to uh, uh, Pittsburgh and West Virginia, and they're a different team, and you got to give them credit. And, and I, th I love Notre Dame's team. I think that uh, they're young, but, boy, there's a lot of weapons there, and they're obviously very well coached. So I think it's a great matchup. This is the February 6th ball game at the Meadowlands, and that was that crushing pick by Phil Hickey and Shaheen Holloway, which kept Shaheen out of a number of ball games. But Troy Murphy, 19 points per game, 9.6 rebounds, and Notre Dame goes on to win. Yeah, and Troy's a tough matchup for Seton Hall, for anybody for that matter, but for a team like ourselves or Seton Hall, he presents a lot of problems. So if they can keep him under control, I think they have a good chance to win. Also in the top of that bracket, Syracuse against Boston College. Syracuse won the season series 2 nothing. 
and this should be an interesting ball game, but I think the Orangemen just are a better team in terms of what they've accomplished this year and their overall talent. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that they're particularly the difference with these two teams is the inside strength. I love BC's youth, and I love the way that they came on at the end of the year, which is always tough to do, but I, I think they they're just have such bad matchups at the inside game that, that that's going to be the key. But, uh, you know, again, you never know in the tournament. Okay, here's a look at the rest of that bracket. Villanova will take on West Virginia in an opening round match, and Villanova won the season series, although the game at Nova on December 12th was a very good basketball yeah, game. Well, West Virginia has that in them. You know, there's a lot of talent there, and their system can give you problems. You've got to take care of the basketball, and you've got to be sharp. And, but that's what Villanova has done so well. They finished the year, I think, just markedly improved and just, just doing a great job of getting their inside players involved and having a nice scoring balance. All the things you want your team to do down the stretch, Villanova has done. And you got to like their team going into the tournament. John Celeste with that big bucket in that game that really proved to be the difference as Villanova went on to the victory. But problem is, right. you know, Steve Lapis doesn't get excited enough. He got a little <laughs> yeah. more excited. His team would be all right. But, you know, you look at those matchups and you say, okay, what did we do well the first time? Can we do it again? They always say it's tough to beat a team three times in a season. Do you believe in that at all? Not really. You know, I think if you do what you need to do and get it done, you win the game. That's it. You got to, you know, kind of get your kids out of that mindset about what happened the last time. Prepare for the for your strengths and do what you have to do, and and, and you'll take care of business. And like I said, Villanova is definitely a team that's hitting on all cylinders right now. And you got to like them in this tournament. All right. Look now at the bottom part of the bracket. Rutgers taking on Pittsburgh. The winner meets St. John's, and in the other ball game, it's Providence Georgetown with the winner taking on Miami. These teams split their two meetings earlier this season. Jamel Thomas led the league in scoring, a dangerous offensive weapon for the Friars. Yeah, and that might be the difference. You know, these are two pretty evenly matched teams, and well, I wouldn't want to officiate this game. There might be 100 fouls called in this game. They're going to go after each other like crazy. But I think Jamel Thomas is the difference in the sense that he's a guy that can get 25, 30 points. Georgetown doesn't really have a guy like that. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some interesting matchups. But I think that's probably the most uh, intriguing first-round matchup, and it's going to be some bloodbath, I'll tell you that. Georgetown is playing extremely solidly right now. They came into the rack and came away with a win as well. A short break, some final thoughts coming up on the Kevin Madden Show during Tournament Week at the Garden. Stay with us. The Rutgers destiny. They're 17-11 overall, number 39 in the RPIs, 5-5 five five in the last 10 ball games, 0-7 against teams in the top 25. Kevin, what do you have to do? Do you have to win one game or two games to get into the NCAA tournament? Well, I think two were definitely in one. I think that, that the odds are we're in. I mean, if you look at all the important factors of, that the committee looks at, so many of them are on our side. Are 100%? No. Most of them are, are, are on our side if we only get one win. So we'll find out our destiny this week. It's pretty exciting, but I, we still have a chance to be an NCAA team, and that's what we're shooting for. Are the kids feeling the pressure? No, I don't think so at all. I think the kids have been great, you know. We haven't played well. We got it. We got better stuff in us. We can bring better stuff to the table, and that's what we plan on doing in the tournament. Good luck. Have a great tournament. Thank you. That's it for the Kevin Bannon Show. I'm Bruce Beck. We'll see you next week, everybody. Matchup of the quarters, which really could happen, and I'll tell you, the, the Garden could be rocking for that one. That, that could really be great, and you know, I think it's the sort of thing that the Big East has been looking to build for, you know, for many years now. I mean, you know, when Rutgers came in and Seton Hall came in, St. John's was in, everyone was hoping that the Metropolitan area would become really the mecca of Big East college basketball. Right. And Rutgers has played St. John's very well this year. You know, they were beating them down in Piscataway before they lost that game. They played them pretty tough at the Garden. They're a team that knows that if they want to get an NCAA bid, the only way that that's going to happen is if they at least get to the Big East Conference Championship. If they can get that far, then they're right back in the hunt. But if not, they're out. See, I think Rutgers, with one win, could be in. I really do. Their RPI is 39. Obviously, they're only 5-5 five and five in their last 10. They've struggled against top 25 teams. If they get to the conference semis, I think they're definitely, if they beat St. John's, that would be a, a definite tick. But if they win one and lose the other at 18 and 12, I mean, that's the classic bubble number. I just have a funny feeling that there's just not that many good teams this year. I've determined that the only reason why a lot of these coaches get paid really big bucks is right. because for this week alone, 
they will either lose their sanity or maintain their sanity <laughs> for this one reason, because they're all sitting there doing exactly what you and I are doing. <laughs> they're looking at their RPIs. They're looking at their quality wins. They're looking at, you know, what happened in the past. Teams with 18 wins, they always got in. Teams with, you know, a winning record in their conference, they always got in. But you never know what's going on around the country. You never know if all of a sudden someone's going to come up and win the Atlantic 10 you didn't expect, and there goes another at-large spot. That's another good point, Len. You, you root this week, if you're on the bubble, for everything to go according to form. Right. For teams to win their conferences that are ranked in the top 12. For nobody to show up to just run the table and, and upset somebody, because then all of a sudden, that throws the monkey wrench into the right. equation. And things haven't gone according to form until like 1976, when Indiana went undefeated and won the national championship. Right. So you know that there's going to be an upset. I mean, heck, where did St. Peter's come from tonight? They're playing in the MAC championship game, and they give Siena a pretty good game for three quarters of it. So you just absolutely never know. George Mason was not supposed to win its tournament. Um, you know, Murray State was supposed to win its tournament easily. It took a last second dramatic shot last night for them to win and get in. So really, anything can happen and will happen this week. All right, and looking at the Big East, one of the intriguing ball games is the 8-9 match. Thanks. How are you? Good, Ben. All right, well, first of all, let me just say that I do agree with everybody about uh, Rutgers' uh, second half of the season collapse. Definitely, they've gone downhill, but still, you have to accept that they do have some talent. Yep. and can pull off a couple wins possibly in the Big East tournament? I think they've got the ability to do that. I really do. I think if they beat Pittsburgh, and I think they should beat Pittsburgh, I have a funny feeling they could play St. John's tough. No, you never know. I mean, we, we played them right in their, uh, in their backyard in the garden and stuck with them until, until we collapsed kind of like we did this season. Hey, these guys know each other. You know, the, the playgrounds, uh, you talk about the other type of leagues, you know, uh, Riverside and the Gauchos. Lenny, anytime you play against a kid you see in the playground, there's something extra there. Oh, there yeah. absolutely is. You know, it's interesting. I was, I was talking to Mike Jarvis today, and I said, what can you really get out of watching that Rutgers pick game? What can you get out of scouting it? And when it came right down to it, he said absolutely nothing. You know, we've played them, they've played us, we know them, they know us. At this time of the year, you worry about your own backyard. You make sure that the things that you've got to take care of. If I'm St. John's, I'm in the gym shooting 100 free throws a day right now because that's what they don't do well. If I'm Rutgers, I'm in the gym and I'm boxing out because I know if I play St. John's, these guys are going to come at me on the glass like, you know, animals with steak on up there. So that, that's the thing that you've got to be aware of. It's not so much what are they doing, what are we doing. And when you talk about St. John's, they have done a lot well with Bootsy Thornton burying threes and with the point guard and Barkley making the right decisions. Yeah, you know, very, very difficult team to play because of what you just said. They have great balance on both sides of the ball. Offensively, very few teams in the country have five plays and double-figure scoring. Defensively, you know, there's no one really bigger than 6'9 out there. There's no one smaller than 6'1 out there. All athletic, all city kids, all tough. Switch on defense. They don't get caught in mismatches. And boy, they come to play every night. And here at the Garden, you can see that Rutgers did a lot of things well against St. John's. They were able to go to the hole. They were unselfish with their offensive attack. This bodes well for them if they do get to see him again. You know, I, I can understand why people are a little bit disappointed with Rutgers because, you know, just two weeks ago it looked like they were a lock. I mean, right. everyone was certain that they were getting in. And I think we've got to keep in mind that, you know, this is only the second year of an extensive rebuilding process. I mean, they obviously have some great talent that is going to lift them. Dante Jones is a player for the future. There's no question about it. They've got a great class coming in. So, you know, you take those things and you put it together and you say, you know what, if they don't get in, this is the burn, this is the sting that they'll remember all through the summer into next year. And what happens here is you have to judge a coach by four or five years because he's got to get his kids to the point where they're seniors. Then you can judge a program and a coach that comes in, I believe. Absolutely. And I think he's done a great job thus far. I mean, you know, Billet clearly is playing for him. If he wasn't, his brother wouldn't have signed to come there. You know, Hudson is playing for him. I mean, I think he's doing all the right things. He's made the commitment to here in the metropolitan area. He's getting the kids from New Jersey. To me, it's just a matter of time before Rutgers, Seton Hall, St. John's, they're all there every year going after those top kids around here. And, you know, we're doing three shows a week. And I'll tell you something, <laughs> you're right. But the thing is, if you look at Rutgers and they win one more game, they'd be sitting in a different position now. They played Georgetown close. They played Miami close. Uh, you know, they played St. John's close. You win one of those ball games, they beat Syracuse. You know, things could turn around. It's, it's, it's that kind of a weird season. Steven River Edge. Steve, how you doing? Hey, thanks for taking Had to appear on CNA. they got to be snappy dressers. Supply me with some great answers. It's all for fun, and I am the only judge. So without further ado, here's my best dress coach for 1999. 
some coaches took themselves out of the running from the start, like Tim Capstraw of Wagner. I don't have one of those bodies that are made for clothes. I, I, I just not one of those real sleek bodies. And, uh, you know, when I go for my sizes, things never seem to work out. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not long and lean, and uh, I just try to make do with mixing and matching. For others, selection was a problem. Unfortunately, my wardrobe's not, uh, I guess, significant enough or, uh, or big enough that I have that choice. I have my two or three sport coats that I just rotate from game to game and hope that uh, when someone sees me at one game, they don't realize I just wore this two games ago. Bill Carmody of Princeton hardly wore a jacket and tie all year long. Was he trying to set a trend? <laughs> No, I think like Calipari, one of those guys, probably is, is a trendsetter. I'm, I'm a follower in this regard. Others, like Bill Harrion of Drexel, said they never really gave it a thought. I've got the Irish blood, okay? My, 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 my blood gets a little warm and a little boiling, and I, I sweat very easily. So for me to wear, you know, $1,000 suits uh, is not going to make a lot of sense because they're not going to last long. So I, I don't get real concerned about how I look on the sideline. I'm obviously you know, way more concerned about how my basketball team looks. Still other coaches admitted to me that they left the tough choices to the experts, their wives. I have a very nice wardrobe. My wife uh, has to color coordinate. I can't uh, match any colors at all. My wife buys my suit, so she has a terrific job. You know, I, I have like two suits and a sport jacket. And I just wear them every other game, whatever my wife puts out. So I don't have a lot of clothes either. Sorry, guys. My rule is you have to dress yourself. So let's meet our five finalists. Some try to keep it simple. And for Dick Kuchin at Yale, it works. I've never been one of those kinds of guys that worried about worried about the wardrobe. I used to do a little modeling for Rochester's Big and Tall, so they get a little bit of a plug. But the fact of the matter is I'm probably a blue blazer and gray slack kind of guy. Uh, I'd prefer to get dressed up outside the arena. It takes confidence, and Fran Dunphy of Penn has plenty of it. I think I'm an outstanding dresser as it is, so each time I'm out there, I, I don't worry too much about what it is I have on. You have to be serious about your appearance, and Tom Green of FDU pays attention to details. Absolutely. Uh, TV games, you know, you know you're going to get a little more exposure than you normally do. Uh, make sure I've got my new suit on tonight, and a uh, brand new tie, and shoes are polished, and teeth are brushed, and hair's comb. I don't have many hairs left, but uh, they're comb for sure. And you have to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk. Don Harnum of Ryder can do both. You know, you do, do the best you can with what you have. Well, it's definitely better than Tim Capstraw at Wagner, definitely better than Dave Calloway at Monmouth. And our last finalist, Kevin Bannon of Rutgers. He says he likes to get dressed up. And as the former boss of the current Ryder coach, Bannon says Don Harnum needs to take a long look in the mirror. He thinks he dresses well, but if he didn't have his wife, I, I think he'd probably wear his pajamas to the games and think that he looks good. time for the moment we've all been waiting for. Yes, the crowd here at Jadwin Jim on pins and needles. Who is the best dress coach for 1999? Well, the envelope, please. And the award will go to Kevin Bannon of Rutgers. Well, he couldn't be here tonight, but he did want to thank Tony McIntosh who designs all his clothes, and I want to thank all the college coaches for having a lot of fun with me all year long. We're at halftime. The Ivy League Championship on the line. we got a special interview when we come back, so stay with us.